Welcome to Future of Diversity, a guest chef program inviting chefs of color in the Seattle community to showcase their talent in culinary ventures at Osteria La Spiga. My name is Sabrina Tinsley, and I'm the executive chef and co-owner of Osteria La Spiga. And with me this evening is Chef Anna Science. Anna Science is the marketing lead for content and programs at Metropolitan Market. She's also a recipe developer and culinary instructor and loves to share her passion for the richness of Mexican gastronomy. Ana has served as the chef for the Mexican consulate in Seattle, collaborating with local chefs to create Mexican menus for diplomatic events. She also co-created a food business incubator, a 12-week program on how to start your own food business and collaborated with renowned restaurant consultants in the area. Hi, Anna. Welcome. And thank you. Hi, for being here. How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you for inviting me over. Oh, of course. It's so good to see you. So I wanted to start here. I wanted to start with, um, I, I heard through the grapevine that you are an advocate or an ambassador for the Latino community here in Seattle. Oh, that's Tell a little bit about that. So uh, I think in, um, in the area of gastronomy, uh, I've been, uh, since I finished culinary school, I've been trying to focus on uh, getting people to know the richness and the vastness of Mexican cuisine. Uh, because what would you see here, it's uh, more narrow and there are so many regi regions and so many ingredients and techniques that make uh, Mexican cuisine one of the richest cuisines in the world. Um, so whether it has been through cooking classes or you know, working with the consulate and now in my work as a lead of content for Metropolitan Market, I've been trying to introduce uh, the people uh, or the customers to uh, traditional Mexican cuisine, as well as other cuisines from the world when there's an opportunity. That's beautiful. And would you consider yourself a food activist? I don't know if you what you consider as an activist. Uh, I'm I, I consider myself sometimes a tradition a traditionalist. Uh, like I try to keep things as close to its core as possible. Um, there are occasions that I would swap one ingredient or another, but always trying to keep the essence of a dish as a whole as possible. So if that makes me an activist, yes, I would be considered an activist. Yeah, that's an interesting point because I've um, I've noticed I've traveled to Mexico many times. I've been there six times, and I've noticed a really big difference between the the cuisine that I find in Mexico and the the Mexican food here that I can find here. Not always, but a lot of times I've noticed that um, it tends to be more Americanized uh, when I find it here. Can you talk a little bit about um about that and why you think that you know the the american influenced uh mexican food would be more commonplace so um what i think and one of the things that i have found that um is that they use like the the, the portions uh, is one of the things that sometimes it surprises me um like in mexico you would get enchiladas and it would be a small plate with three enchiladas with a little bit of chicken inside and here you get these dishes that are huge, always with rice, always with beans. Um, so I think it's that, that philosophy that more is better, whether like in Mexico, it's just like a small full of flavor or a smaller full of flavor dish. That's one of the things that has a, like always surprised me here. Also the, the use of certain ingredients like, um, like cream or cheese in every single dish, like, uh, yeah, there are dishes in Mexico that I have cheese and cream. Like an enchilada will have a little bit of cream, but not even all enchiladas will have cheese, for example. Um, so the, 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 the amount of cheese and cream that is used or also cumin. Um, like food in Mexico, depending on the region, yeah, there's cumin that is used, but not in the amount that is used here in the US. That's right. Yeah, because I remember growing up in the tacos that I had were with the crispy shell and the ground beef with the packet of seasoning that you would buy at the store, which was very cumin heavy. And I never, never really enjoyed that. And I remember my first experience going to Mexico was in um, 
in Tijuana. We went to Tijuana yes. just across the border because we were in California. And I, I still to this day remember the burrito that I had there and it was completely different than anything yeah. I had experienced. It's, um, it's a, an amazing, amazing cuisine. You're right. Yeah, no, I love it. And as you mentioned, even the burritos, the burritos are, are like this kind of like thick at the most with maybe one or two fillings, like it will have beef or it will have beef and be, be like, or meat and beans or chicken and beans, but it's not this thick, uh, you know, hodgepodge of things. It's more like straight to the core of the main ingredient and that's it. So it's very different from the burritos that we would get here. So yeah, I think here everything is super sized yeah. and cheesy and super sized versus what you get there. Yeah, so no chimichangas. Yeah, there are chimichangas, but they're oh. smaller. Okay. <laughs> they're like just being thinner and yeah. So I'm curious about your upbringing. I have no idea where you grew up. And, and I'm curious about how your childhood led you to a career in food. So uh, I was born and raised in Mexico City. Um, both my mom and my grandmother both were uh, super into cooking. Uh, actually, my mom went to college. She would have loved to study culinary, but there was no culinary school at that time in Mexico City. So she went to hospitality. So all my life, I was a lot about how you could combine food and the textures and the colors of food. So I remember like probably middle school, I wanted to make something for lunch and help my mom. And I might have done, you know, uh, something uh, with a, like a squash with tomato sauce, but it was, and then maybe a fideo soup and both were red. And my mom was like, yeah, you will never serve in a menu to things that are red. So that thing stayed with me forever. When I'm trying to think of a menu, I'm like, I wanted, uh, actually for the menu we are serving, I wanted to do an aguachile instead of the ceviche, but it was green and the mole is green. And I was like, no, I'm not gonna do green and green. So that's kind of like one of the things that in, uh, like really got me into thinking of food since an early age. And, uh, and I grew up with a combination of some Spanish influence in Mexico City, as well as in other cities in Mexico, there's a big, uh, there's some influence from Spain, as if Mexico was conquered by Spain. So I grew up, whether eating mole one day for a celebration, another paella another day for a celebration. Um, so those both cultures kind of like build my interest in food. Um, but the more I learn about Mexican food, the more I got passionate about it. So um, when I moved to Seattle, um, I was doing a completely different career in Mexico. And when I moved to Seattle, I found that time to go into culinary school. And that was almost 20 years ago. So, uh, and that's where I started really trying to become an ambassador of Mexican cuisine. That's amazing. Did you go to, what school did you go to? Seattle Central College, Seattle Culinary Academy at Seattle Central College. And it was an amazing experience. Um, I was there as a student uh, for the whole program. And then years later, I came back as a teacher to teach um, food costing and purchasing. And then years later, I came back as part of the technical advisory committee. So I've been there in different stages of uh, my culinary career, which has been really good to be able to give back. That's wonderful. And we're um, now um, the culinary school was slated to be to end. Uh, yeah, but they've uh, received a stay. So it sounds like um, sounds like we're going to be able to keep that culinary program, which is essential for our community. I mean, yeah, it's it's done it's done amazing it's produced so many amazing chefs it would be a shame to lose it for sure yeah yeah it would be really sad and still there's work work to do I think right now we they gave it that extension so I think there's um a lot of a lot of things that we can we need to dig in and figure out what was, would be the best way to make it a sustainable program right. from the economic side of view um I love, uh, I don't know if you have ever eaten there as for lunch, 
but they have incredible launches like that you can just pop in as a regular person and it's cheap and it's delicious. Yeah, it's, it, it's a really incredible program. Yep, the best kept secret on Capitol Hill for sure. Exactly, the best kept, yeah, the best lunch in Capitol yeah. Hill. A hundred percent. Yeah. Great. So um, we really appreciate the fact that you agreed to be our featured chef for this uh, program. So we're doing a mezcal class Yeah. Um, and you have paired uh, an amazing menu to go with the mezcal. Um, and so um, I would love to hear um, maybe you can explain your each of each of the dishes and uh, we can talk a little bit about that. Sure, Sabrina. Um, so uh, when you reach out to me to talk about a, a mezcal dinner, actually, I was about to go to Oaxaca again. And, um, and I just start thinking, what are the flavors that pair well with the mezcal? So the first one is orange. So uh, for our first course, I created a, a ceviche that is not Oaxacan. It's more Acapulco style. And the Acapulco style ceviche is one made in a tomato base. So it's more of a kind of a pico de gallo-ish ceviche with lime juice. And sometimes they use even a little bit of ketchup or a tomato paste with vinegar to give that sweetness, sweet sour flavor. So that's when I, I thought about um, orange being a perfect pairing in that ceviche. Uh, so we're gonna have a, that as a first course and instead of fish I'm using herds of palm. And, uh, I'm using hearts of palm because they are safer to keep outside for a long, a slightly longer period of time. And since people are gonna take the food to their home and then serve them, I thought it was it's a better product to use a um, for a takeout dinner rather than a ceviche. Um, and I love hearts of palm because they have that kind of like al dente texture that it has a bite to your when you're biting biting it and also has the briny flavor so it really brings some of the characteristics of fish in the ceviche um so it's a kind of a plant-based ceviche ceviche so so yeah when i think of ceviche i think of fish and so but yeah. you've reimagined it with heart of palm is that typical no it's not that let's say let's say in Mexico City, you will find it more at homes of people than out of a restaurant or something like that. It's something that I might go to a luncheon and they would serve it as one of an options. Um, that's a, like, especially when it's warm, like in the spring or in the summer, um, they will serve that as an appetizer or a first course. So it's something that I used to eat there quite a bit before moving to Seattle. And then is heart of palm exactly as it sounds like the heart of a palm tree? It's a special palm tree that is not like vertical, like the palm trees that we see in California. It's a kind of a bu bushy, kind of bushy palm tree that has like sh of shoots like that go cl grow closer to the ground. And it's the core of those of shoots from the core of the palm, yes. Got it. And so, and those are cultivated, I'm guessing. That you're getting, I'm guessing. Oh. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to the next dish. What do we have next? So next we're gonna have a green mole. Um, in Oaxaca, Oaxaca is, um, it's supposed to have like a several types of mole, like a coloradito that is a reddish orange mole, uh, a yellow mole, the green mole, the black mole, um, there's, I, I tasted one with uh, capers, the alcaparrado the other day, uh, while, I, while I was in Oaxaca a few weeks ago, there's one with almonds. So all of these moles, uh, as it was in a restaurant, I was talking to a chef in a restaurant, he was explaining us his moles and we were having this conversation. From his point of view, like there are maybe one or two moles that are hardcore moles and the others are, the other moles are more of a stew. So if you think of this mole, it's more of a stew kind of mole. Uh, it doesn't have the 30 ingredients. Like I have my recipe for the black mole has 30 ingredients. This green mole has less than 10. And, it's, um, and it has a fresher flavor to it. 
So I thought it would be interesting to bring this traditional recipe from Oaxaca where mezcal is traditional from uh, and introduce uh, all the customers to it or nice. um, because it's a less well known mole than the black mole. And what makes it green? Uh, it's a mixture like it's tomatillos, it's um, pumpkin seeds, um, onion, garlic, cilantro, uh, lettuce or kale has some leaves. And then um, sometimes it includes hoja santa that is kind of a, a herb traditional of Mexico. So um, I actually gonna try sometimes uh, you can find it here in Mexican stores. So I'm, I'm gonna try to include it. Nice. But I still like I have taught it in classes, these without the hoja santa to make it easy for people to make it and if the flavor is delicious it's more of a clean fresh flavor than a traditional mole less heavy got it and we're going to serve it with tortillas okay that's what i was going to ask you about next okay so tell us about these tortillas these are homemade right they're like there's this uh couple that uh, started uh mixed um uh, corn and um for those of you that don't know what mixed amylize session is um, traditional corn tortillas go through a process called mixed amylization where the dried corn is cooked with mineral lime to remove the outer layer of the corn so you cook it in it and you let it soak and by the time you are going to rinse it the outer layer becomes almost like gelatin and it's removed with water and this makes the corn way more nutritious and also more digestible and that's how it has been done since forever. Uh, in the old days, uh, it was cooked like this and then it was grinding a metate. Um, and I have a metate here, if you wanna see it, I maybe can bring it, let me just grab it. So um, a metate is this, this is a small version of it. It's a big stone, um, lava stone with a grinder and um, like, the people grinding it will sit in one end and with both hands will go grind uh, the corn by hand, little by little. And when you grind it like this, you'll make a paste. And this paste is the one you use to make tortillas. So that's the, tra the, the traditional way to do it right now. The mixed amylization, it will, it will be made in bats, like in a larger scale, and then it will be grind in a Kind of if a, a, a meat grinder, like just imagine a meat grinder, but it's with a with the stones, with lava stones, that will rotate to grind the the masa. Wonderful. And who's what's the name of the couple or the the company that makes this? The company is called Milpa Masa, Milpa. and um, and it's a husband and wife uh, husband and wife team, and they are super super nice. It's a really small company uh, in West Seattle. They are open to the public uh, Saturdays and Sundays, I think 12 to noon, roughly. Uh, and the rest they deliver to restaurants. Um, and yeah, their product is amazing. They use a lot of local corns and they mix the mylize it there and they make, they sell you either the masa or they also sell you the tortillas already made. So we'll be using the tortillas from them for the dinner. If they, is the masa dry or is that a paste? No, it's fresh masa. Okay. And it's fresh masa and with that masa, I love it. I, I love to make sopes, for example. So whenever I get a chance on my weekend to take a run to uh, West Seattle, I just go and get it and, uh, and make sopes or make guaraches. I don't know if you have ever had a guarache. I haven't. Have you had sopes? Yes. So imagine a sope that is like a kind of a thick tortilla with an edge. The guarache doesn't have an edge, but it's a thicker tortilla. And it's like an oval like this. Um, like guarache means sandal. So it's the size of a sandal, like a one foot long, like kind of like slightly thicker tortilla. And you will make it like a sope. You will put beans on top and then chicken or your favorite meat. And then the lettuce, a little bit of crema, a little bit of cheese and salsa. And you will eat it with knife and fork. And in my house, it's one of our favorite meals. Like it's a great dinner and it's rich. You have lots of protein, lots of fiber. Like it's a very complete dinner. That sounds amazing. I'm going to have to try that. So if I go and buy the masa, 
it's already ready for me to make tortillas with just as yes. it is. I don't have to do anything. As it is, you don't have to do anything. You just would have to press it if you have a tortilla press. Mm -hmm. Or in the case of um, what, I check, what I do is I just kind of like make a kind of uh, like a, a thick kind of a piece and then you can roll it with a rolling pin. Okay. And you just need to leave it like maybe a quarter of an inch thick, roughly. And then you just cook it in low heat in the griddle. Okay. So Milpa Masa in okay. West Seattle, open yes. from 12 to... When? Yeah, and it's always okay. in the, on their Instagram. Instagram, okay. Yeah, in their Instagram, you can see what the hours are because sometimes they change it. But it's usually Saturdays and Sundays in the morning uh, that they are open to the public until they run out. So it's better to go early because the first time I went and they were out. Yeah. <laughs> if you're going to make the trip to West Seattle. <laughs> yes, you better go early and make sure you get your tortillas. Exactly. Um, that's great. And so uh, what do you have for dessert for us? Uh, so for dessert, the last one, um, I was inspired by mole. Um, for those of you that doesn't know what mole is, mole is a sauce that is quintessential of Mexican gastronomy. It's there's um, there's are two black moles that are very famous. I think the most famous is the Oaxacan one. There's one in Puebla that is as famous as the Oaxacan one, maybe or around the same. And they are it's a mix of chiles, seeds, nuts, and uh, and it's finished with chocolate. So it's a sauce that has this sweetness and it's spice and it's rich. Uh, so we're gonna have a, a chipotle infused brownies. Uh, that is my, it's a take to bring like kind of the heat and the spice and the richness and the chocolate into a dessert. That sounds And uh, we are gonna serve it with a little bit of uh, mezcal infused creme anglaise. That sounds like the perfect finish. So, but can you go uh, into a little bit more detail? This is a, this is a project, right? It's uh, the, the, the mix, right? Yeah, the brownies. Um, so yeah, the brownies is a, it's a, it's actually my daughter and her friend's project. They are, they're freshmen in high school. And uh, during the early days of the pandemic, like two years ago, so it has been a slow project. Uh, they were bored in the evening so one day they made a uh, brownies from a mix and they were like hey i think we could do something like that can we create they asked me if they could create a, a brownie mix so i taught them how to create a baking formula like the percentages and all that part of thinking as a baker and uh, they started creating a brownie mix so little by little with uh, her friend's family and us we have created a company and now we are going through permits and uh, we are helping them design uh, their label and getting the packaging so they can uh, start selling the, the brownie mix. What an amazing experience for, for a young person. I mean, yeah. they're, they're going to have the tools to, you know, to be great business people growing up. So that's, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, uh, I think it's, it's fun. And I think the fact that they took that time in the pandemic to do something productive was for me was awesome. It was very enriching for them and it was good to see them thriving with, when it was like a time that was like hard for them because they were not seeing many friends and they were at home, studying at home. So, so it was like, it was a blessing. Yeah, that's great. So the, the idea of putting chipotle in the brownies, where did that come from? And um, also, before you answer that question, I just have to admit that even though I realize that it, that you have to learn about food at some point in your life, but I only recently, probably within the past couple of weeks, realized that chipotle was um, made from jalapeno, jalapeno peppers. I didn't yeah. know that. So, and I felt, and I started asking around, everybody else knew it except for me, apparently. So tell us a little, talk a little bit about why you were inspired to use Chipotle in the brownies, and then also tell us about Chipotle. So, um, okay, so Chipotle is a uh, dried um, jalapeno and it's smoky. So it becomes a mild chili or not, it's like, it's not super hot, but has this smoky note. So 
what I like, I like to use the jalapeno in the, sorry, the chipotle in the dessert because it kind of enhances or plays well with the, with the smokiness of the mezcal. And this dessert actually, is, it's so funny because when I graduated from culinary school, I made this cake that had chipotle in it. And, uh, and I used to serve it, I created a, this, a mezcal ice cream, a mezcal infused ice cream. So this comes from the day when I did my first chef kind of uh, gig as being the chef of the day at Seattle Culinary Academy. In those days, the chef of the day will serve a menu for the whole one of the restaurants. So you were sh chef for, uh, and it was a la carte. Right now it's kind of the same activity, but it's a fixed menu. Back in the day, it was like a la carte. So it was like this whole menu of some appetizers, soup, main courses and desserts. And that was one of my, my desserts back in the day. So I have, I'm always fond of it. I can't wait to taste it. I'm really looking forward to that. Can you speak to um, your feelings about the fact that Chipotle is ubiquitous on Mexican menus here in the United States? And it seems like a, almost like a new fad. And so I'm just curious about um, the, the tradition of Chipotle in Mexico and your feelings about the widespread um, you know, use of Chipotle here. Um, I think one thing um, with chipotle, I think for me, if we have to talk about dried chiles, chipotle is actually not my favorite. Um, I think I'm, I'm a, I love other chiles like Amorita, that is also small and it's, it's more, it has more sweetness, um, a little bit more sweetness, a little bit more heat, uh, or a, an ancho that is also smoky but has a better balance of sweetness and um, sweetness, acidity, or you have a guajillo that is more, a little bit more acid and more crisp tasting. But I think what happens with chipotle, I think it's, it's an easy to find chili. And, and I think that's what has made it become like more mainstream. Um, and, and since it has been coming in a powder form also, for many, many years, it's easy to make rather than, you rarely would use a chipotle that is dry, you will use a powder here in the US. Whether for me, when I'm using a dry chiles, most of the time, not all of the time, for the dessert, I'm gonna use a powder because it mixes better with the flour. But mostly when I'm using dry chiles, I'm using the chili and I'm uh, removing the seeds and removing the veins and then soaking it. And then from there building whatever I'm making. So I think it's just, I think it's an easy, it's easy to find and easy to use. And that's what make it more mainstream. Plus it's fun to say, chipotle. Yeah, chipotle. And um, one thing about the dessert and uh, something that um, I think we talked about so at some point earlier, um, the, like for the, for the dessert, like the chipotle, it's just a hint of chipotle, it's not like, you're gonna taste and it's gonna be spicy or you're gonna taste and it's gonna be hot. It's more like this kind of subtleness that when you're after taste, you're gonna have a little bit of spice and a little bit of smokiness, but your main, your main flavor is gonna be the chocolate. And for me, that's something that sometimes happens with Mexican cuisine, that they try to make it so spicy that you're losing all the variety of flavors that are part of a dish. Um, I think for me, the good Mexican cuisine, it has a balance of more than heat is the flavor of the chiles, but pairing almost always with an acid and pairing like with all of the other pieces. So you get this symphony of flavors rather than something hot that is gonna numb you and you're gonna lose everything else. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. I love that. I love. I love hearing about the, you know, the subtle differences of the, you know, the flavor profiles of the different peppers. So that's awesome. I wanted to, um, uh, we're getting close to, to ending here. I, I'm just, I wanted you to be able to express, like, if somebody wanted to contact you or talk to you about, um, you know, Mexican food or, you know, have you as a guest speaker or what, what, whatever it is, how can people contact you? 
I think um, the best way is for, through my Instagram account, uh, Taste Pacifico. And Taste Pacifico comes from being in the Pacific Coast that kind of like connects Seattle with Mexico. So um, yeah, that probably is the best way to contact me. Um, you can uh, see a lot of the recipes I develop and it's not only Mexican cuisine, but right now most of the recipes I develop are through Metropolitan Market or like 95% of the work I do is um, through Metropolitan Market um, via their emails, their Instagram, um, all the content that is there. I'm, I'm kind of like leading it and uh, trying to make it relevant and interesting and trying to bring flavors from different parts of the world whether in a traditional world, a way that is my favorite, or sometimes uh, just bringing them to things that are more, more common or more familiar also for so people just to lower the barrier of entry. So, uh, because sometimes you feel like, oh, I don't wanna try this, that is completely foreign to me. But if I try this piece that is foreign to me, but it's connected to something that is familiar, I will be willing to try it. So we try to keep a balance between being hardcore and bringing um, pieces, bits and pieces to familiar things. That's great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us. Are there any last words that you wanted to share? Uh, no, I hope you enjoy the meal and it has been an honor to be part of this program. I think uh, the future of diversity and all you have done for diversity in Seattle, it's incredible and I feel honored to be part of it. Thank you for that, Anna. And thank you for being a part of the program. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, take care and have a good night. Thank you. You too, Sabrina. Take All care. Right. Bye bye.